Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, in what is the lucky last of the London recordings, Gary Luckman and I sat down in my Airbnb to talk about C.G. Jung as a person uh, and to talk about what might be his most important ideas. Uh, A good thing, too, as it turned out, I guess, because now more than ever, we all need to turn a friendly face to the unconscious. A quick note, if you are listening to this audio version, bear in mind there's a video version as well, and uh, it was recorded with a new mic uh, on the camera, which means the default settings meant I picked up some weird lamp sound, uh, which we have cleaned up to the best of our ability. The audio does get a lot better toward the end, and also it won't happen again. Uh, And if you just want to watch the interview part of the show, there is a video version available on the post page at runesoup.com. Enjoy. Gary, welcome to my high quality Covent Garden TV studio. <laughs> this, is, this is a lovely place you've got here, Gordon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Airbnb did well. You know, it's funny, um, I read an article years ago, I think when I was still in London, about the Airbnb aesthetic is kind of it's its own form of McDonald's, so that, that kind of millennial sleeve to yeah, yeah, this yeah. kind well, of IKEA kind of everywhere. Or maybe a little bit upgraded from IKEA, sort of. Yeah, it's very nice and angular and clean. And... But there's like there's a there's a language to it that is it's a it's a performance of uniqueness, but because it's a performed uniqueness. It's the same everywhere. Mm-hmm. So you, you kind of have like it's a wacky dependable. rug. Exactly. <laughs> so we're in one of them. We're in one of them in London. Um, we aren't self-quarantined yet. Although with the camera sitting in front of it, it does look like that. Day 27. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope not. It's, um, well, we want to talk about Jung, which mm. is um, definitely worth pursuing. But in a funny way, I guess, starting with the virus, virus um, narrative or... Um, cloud, even <laughs> the viral cloud, ooh, ooh, the, yeah. um, is is a good place to start because a similar thing I think happens with eco alarmism, where you can make the case that people's emotional investment, in, and in particular fear, mm. is is a unhealthy form of reenchantment. Mm, mm, because mm. you were just tell us yeah. a story. You're outside and people are on this lovely day uh. proclaiming the end of the world yeah yeah well jokingly i mean i was yeah. at, i was uh, at, at the queue at uh, a market in my neighborhood uh which the shelves weren't empty they were a couple days earlier but they've been restocked uh but uh you know but there were a lot of people in the queue a lot of people had their baskets you know topped up as much as they could and um you know this one guy was saying kind of joke i didn't catch the whole conversation but it's like whoa it's the end of the world and everyone kind of giggled a little and snickered a little around them and you think god you know <laughs> i mean we've been waiting for that for quite some time even that the kind of build up to something like this i mean i think it's been i mean Jung would say it was kind of archetype of some kind and i understand what you mean it's it's it's, it's kind of a negative transformation in a way mm. it's uh but i i think Jung is very important for a time um it, just in the overall sense that uh, the whole idea that if you don't uh you know make an arrangement or a dialogue with the unconscious, uh, whatever you want to call it, the psyche, um, it'll work out its own needs and purposes uh, in other ways as well, you know, and, uh, you know, you, you you go along for the ride or you're kind of taken, yeah. and uh, this kind of uh, corona mania, you might want to say, well, obviously there are, you know, objective real reasons to be concerned, at the same sure. time it's turned into this kind of craze where people are acting in very neurotic, strange ways. And and it's, it's nested or um, interlocked. Um, neuroses or complexes, let's be a little, little, little bit more Jungian about it, um, because it's to do with a whole bunch of stuff. There's uh, unexamined um, 
death fears for a start, but also mm. it, it speaks to intimacy, intimacy and human contact and all that kind of thing that, as you say, if you haven't done the work of, of looking um, or, or of turning a friendly face to the unconscious, when an event like this happens, you get captured by all kinds of mm. crazy yeah. stuff. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, it's sort of an invitation to, uh, Jung would say, or Jung would say, to uh, project. You need to project these mm -hmm. fears on, and, and the idea that it's some virus that's invisible, too, yes. so you can't really see it, you can't really tell if someone's got it or not, unless you have the gear to be able to test them. So anybody who looks a little bit like they're sweating, yes. <laughs> or something, suddenly they go, oh, by the way, Gordon, are you okay? Are you feeling right? I'm all right. <laughs> you know, uh, so, uh, I mean, I made the mistake a few nights ago of watching uh, the George Romero film, The Crazies, which oh, right. I hadn't seen in ages. I, guess, I think I saw it when it came out in 73. And uh, yeah, you know, it was very, very strange because of the whole scenario is where there's a, Break out of a sort of biological kind of uh, weapon, and then uh, the army's sent in to contain it. But they're all wearing protective gear, so they all look anonymous. They're all in the white gear with the masks and everything. Yeah. And the people don't know what's happening, and so they want to defend themselves against these invaders. And it all just collapses into into chaos. And uh, you know, do yeah, they hold toilet movies. paper in that film? I I don't know. That's a, that's a funny thing. I don't think they had the chance to go. Right. Because it was a very quick acting virus. Right. So, yeah. But I mean, that's the other thing too. I mean. One has to say without getting too graphic or or uh, crude here, but the idea the crisis brings out the priorities in people. I mean, apparently toothpaste is something else that uh, yeah. people were stocking up on. So it's uh, when the the the, t the toilet paper thing. Russian as flush, far as I, I can, yeah. <laughs> as far as I can tell, I think my people started that because I think Australia panicked for toilet paper first, like mm. a week and a half or so ago, right. which is surprising for a couple of reasons. And the only thing I can think of is that maybe during the. Um, like the Suez crisis or um, the, one of the energy crises in the 70s, we must have, some some older Australian must have a memory of us running out of toilet paper. <laughs> this is what happens so when we have a supply chain fear. disruption because we, there was, in the news, like Australia manufactures this toilet paper domestically. Mm. That was in the news like, mm. this isn't going to run out. Right. Everyone relax. Well, this doesn't come from China. I mean, <laughs> I mean, poor Australia. I mean, you had the, the fires, obviously, and now it's like the, and the toilet paper. Not and that, again, it made me think of another film, uh, The Last Wave. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, when we did Gallipoli. Oh, right, right, right. Yes. I know you mean. Hanging and picnic. Yeah. Uh, picnic, picnic and hanging rock. rock. Not hanging and picnic rock, but... Uh, any case, yeah, it's just this apocalypse... Uh, 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 Peter Weir. Peter Weir. Peter Weir, that's it. And, you know, this apocalyptic vision. You know, yeah. Happening in, uh, Australia in has that, speaking yeah. of young, Australia's always been like a, mm. a thing that people can project. Mm. Particularly, we said this at school, particularly like the white apocalypse and mm. post-apocalypse. Mm. Um, Melbourne being one of the, the world cities that survives the nuclear conflagration and so on. So there's this psychological, like, the, the literally white post-apocalypse was how we were yeah. learning about it. Right. You know, kind of. mm. Australia is mm. a weird place for that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, mm. This is why people should talk about things like the young. Yeah. Oh, I think absolutely. Again, it's, uh, why, 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 I mean, again, well, we don't know. I mean, you, you open the can of worms and it's sort of like, okay, we only know what we see on TV or on our mm -hmm. Twitter feeds or something. So um, everyone's got some um, conspiracy theory running, going now, narrative about the, the virus. So, I mean, I'm assuming there is at least uh, a, a strata of actual truth about something going on that's starting this and then everything else gets kind of dumped on top of it. Pretty and, much. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, cosmic Rorschach. Uh, mm. But, uh, like, one of the things I wanted to have a discussion about with you while I was in London, because it is, uh, it pertains to a number of the other events that are going on, mm. is essentially, Jung is a person. So I want to talk about Jung as a person, um, a couple of things that I don't think people, I think, We'll bring some of his ideas and his writings to life if we if we come at them from mm. that angle, yeah. and then um, some of those writings, a, a selection of them, and then because I haven't really done this before, and Jung comes up often on the show, kind of hit a few of the the key ideas that he contributed, not just to what became the mental health world, mm -hmm. but just g generally speaking to culture. So, um, the first question: um, Was he a good person? Well, it depends what you mean by good, I guess. Uh, you know, he had his uh, faults and his foibles. Um, a lot of and, affairs, Gary. Yeah, yeah, this is something. <laughs> well, 
I mean, I just was reading about that um, because I'm, I've, I've been rereading a lot of Jung because I'm about to start a book about synchronicity and, and cool. precognitive dreams. And I was reading about how he and uh, like his contemporary H.G. Wells, and they actually knew each other and met. Um, although Wells was a bit more um, I callous about this, where they had mistresses. Mm. I mean, uh, what, Wells, uh, you know, he, he went to, so far as to put uh, portraits of them up on the mantel. <laughs> his poor wife had to put up with that, but Emma Young had to put up with Young uh, one long-term uh, relationship with Tony Wolfe. Mm. And then there's the the whole thing that got it started with Sabina Spielrein and variety of others. But he was a very impressive, uh, you know, a powerful, dominant figure. And a lot of women, um, you know, came to him and were attracted uh, by him. And uh, they all flocked around him. There was an old joke about the Jungfrau that was supposed to be, you know, all the women that were surrounding Jung and all that. So, I mean, yeah, it depends. It depends on... Um, how strict a moral view you take of this, how much you want to take him to task. I do think, though, that, you know, some of the therapeutic behavior he got up to would be uh, frowned yes. upon today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it was exaggerated in uh, that film, uh, mm -hmm. the dangerous uh, method and all that. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, um, but the, th the thing about that, I mean, just, just to mention the guy who got Jung going um, in that department, because he, he actually was quite straight-laced and conservative, um, but Otto Gross was um, this radical Freudian. And um, his father uh, uh, was a famous criminologist, Hans Gross. And uh, he brought Otto to Freud, because uh, Otto was addicted to cocaine and morphine and was into free love and lots of other wild things at that time. And Freud didn't take him on, but he sent him down to Jung at, in, in Zurich at the Bogotsli uh, clinic. And uh, while Jung was treating Sabine Spielrein, he was also supposed to be analyzing Otto Gross, but Gross turned it around and he started analyzing Jung and telling Jung that, yeah, you should you should be less conservative, you should cut loose, you have to, you know, that would have been throw, a throw thing. off, throw off. He has a he has a brief kind of appearance in, in the what's his name's film. Um, uh, but uh, no, actually I thought of writing a book about him, but I have to get around to it. But in any case, no, Jung, Jung you know, I, I think yeah, he allowed himself and he even said in in, in correspondence with Freud that uh, you know the basis of a good marriage is um, uh, allowing a certain infidelity. Mm. In but do you like think that. do you think Emma got the same? Because that's the thing. I in the twenty first century, how people yeah. run their relationships. Does she have affairs? Yeah. Uh, I, I think I think there's some speculation that she may, so. may have. Yeah. I hope uh, so. She certainly yeah. confided a lot in Freud about this. This was they had they had a correspondence mm. about this. Yeah. Um, I and there's so. times when she had enough and she was leaving she was leaving him and then what would happen is Jung would collapse he would he would become absolutely helpless and I mean I remember that in your book and that's yeah. why that's what I'm like mm, I don't think you're and that's why I wanted to ask the good question like I, I, was he a good person question because I think he was a good person I think he had his faults like most people yeah. do and because but he that was a great true. person in the sense of a genius and all that the faults loom larger than, than, than you know all of us put it this way there's a lot of uh, unfaithful husbands who didn't write words that's a good genius. point <laughs> so, but like, not to condone it but to say you know. yeah. so for people who are unaware um, Emma came from money so yeah, um, yeah. quite a bit of it. So because of that, um, I mean, Jung ended up making his own money, but there was mm -hmm. he had the runway mm -hmm. that he needed mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. become oh, Jung. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And it just there's just something a bit manipulative, as you say. That she tried to leave him several times, and he would sort of revert back to the um, illness as excuse thing that he had as a kid mm -hmm. and collapse yeah, and yeah. get I mean, seriously yeah, ill so yeah. that she couldn't leave. Yeah. That's a dick move. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, what, you know, what, what can you say? I mean, it, it's, uh, yeah, it was true about him, but um, if, uh, it, it, you know, you could assess him on that on that alone, let's say, or uh, more heavily on that than other things and, you know, come up to the conclusion that he wasn't a good person. But I, I think in general, uh, he was, he, you know, he seemed very generous. He uh, apparently was uh, very, very friendly and congenial. He was kind of, you know, large mm -hmm. character, larger than life sort of character. Uh, and Emma stayed, you know, yeah. uh, she had the children. I guess she also, you know, got s some... Uh, amount of satisfaction at being, you know, Mrs. Mrs. Young. You know, Tony Wolf wasn't Mrs. Young. I mean, she Good was point. she was around, but uh, um, so yeah. I mean, I I don't want to defend him on on this. Point, oh yeah, but, it's, uh, but I you know I, I could see well yeah you know. Uh, but if you're going to start racking up you know the number of geniuses who were who were sure. real sons of bitches, I mean I think he'll <laughs> he 
seem like rank mid range. The, 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 was worse. Yeah, the point's <laughs> well made, right? That um, there are plenty of other husbands yeah. who might marry for money, yeah. um, which I don't think he did, but he ended up getting it. Well, the you story know? is that he saw her first when he was 21 and she was 14, and he said, "I'm going to marry this woman." Mm. And it wasn't until however many years later that he started to, you know, actually court her, and she turned him down at first and all that, and um, so. Uh, I'm sure she had many other suitors. Um, yeah. So you know, I, I, I don't. She wasn't sitting on the shelf. I don't think no. waiting for anybody to pick her up. So you know, she must have seen something in you. Yeah. Good. Yeah. All right. So potentially an easier question: um, Was he a good writer? That's that's uh, that's uh, I think uh, easier question to answer. <laughs> um, he's not the most clearest. Uh, oh, excuse me. See, I'm bad there. Most clearest. He's not the most clear. Um, writer of his ideas. Uh, no. He is served well by people like Marie-Louise von Franz uh, and the other who I, I, I find very good at uh, making Jung's ideas clear is uh, Anthony Storr, who is a Jungian analyst. Uh, he died some years ago. Um, but uh, no, he's um, in a way he's sort of like Heidegger, though I think he is more readable than Heidegger. Yes, sure. um, that Because he's obscure, uh, he creates an industry around him, you know, trying to explain him and, and all that sort of things. But the funny thing is he can be. Um, when he does his introductions to things, I mean, if you if you if you know his introduction or whatever it is, his preface or something, or forward to uh, the Secret of the Golden Flower, this is one of the most important things he wrote, and it's one of the most clearest, most clear things. And keep doing that. Most clear thing uh, he wrote about uh, two very very important of uh, his ideas: active imagination and the transcendent function. Although he doesn't name them in the, this piece itself, but he's talking about them in the context of Chinese alchemy. And it's actually, it's very readable. Uh, or, um, let's see, uh, uh, his introduction to the I Ching. Yeah. And things that sort of, and Some of his, the lectures, yeah. His, his lectures are very clear, yeah. too. It, I, I think when he starts to write something, he kind of <clears throat> puts on his, you know, academic hat and, you know, I'm here, Dr. Professor, and it has to be this, and it comes out in this very turgid, often very turgid, um, German professorial kind of prose that um, he's not a page turner. I mean, he can uh, things like uh, an, uh, answer to to job and um, again some of the later writing, maybe the undiscovered self. It's a bit because I think these are more written for um, popular kind of audiences yeah. rather than psychological uh, papers and that. So no, he's. Uh, I mean, Arthur Kessler said he's just, he's a, he's a good a sad example of a great mind tying itself up in knots. You know. <laughs> Especially when he's trying to talk about synchronicity and things of well, that sort. Well, yeah. so that because the, the name of your book, and we were just talking about where the title came from before we hit the record button, right? Mm. Um, the question of was he a mystic is mm. is couched in a whole thing that happened to him and to some extent Freud as well, where they did have to um, they had to kind of like if they want to invent an entire industry, they have to kind of science up their nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. So there's always this tension, as you say, it's the her doctor professor thing. When he's sitting down to write his the, uh, the uh, books for a essentially a medical um, audience, he has to sound as sciencey and and, yeah. and fancy yeah. pants yeah. as possible, yeah. and it's. Um, in many respects, it's a pity, but it's it's the other side of was he a mystic because he would disavow that in a in a mm. in, we'll, mm. we'll get to that in, in just a moment. But because of that, it's the same thing, right? Like um, was he a mystic is also the reason perhaps why some of the writing has the as you call it the her doctor professor mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, yeah, I I, th I think he feels like he needs to do that. It's also. Um, well, I think at times he's not, he, he doesn't quite know exactly what he's trying to say, and he sort of goes round, I mean, he sort of has an idea, and he even says it's sort of the circumambulation, so it's not this direct, I mean, Marie-Louise en France is more masculine in that sense, because it's very direct, she's very straightforward, direct, I mean, a lot of her books are actually made up of lectures, but they're very, very, you know, concise, unclear, uh, and she gets to the point where Jung, it's sort of like this, I mean, I think one of the problems with Jung is he'll start out, Giving you examples and illusions is his, you know, his method of amplification. You know, linking things up to different mythological things, and then on page two of that, you've forgotten what the initial trigger was to get this this yeah, this, yeah, this, yeah. this chain of associations yeah. going. And I'm kind of okay, but um, and so I think he gets carried away like that. I mean, his first big book, Symbols of Transformation, is is like that. But also in that book, this is where he makes his break with Freud, and he kind of hid hid that. He hid, hid the ingredient that was certainly going to make it clear that he, you know, he and Freud were going different ways. That's towards the end of the book and it's, this is, you know, a lot 
before then you have to kind of get through to, to, to get to that and uh, but uh, no I, I, I think like the archetypes I'd say I mean he talks about them as uh, inherited uh, characteristics sort of Lamarckian you yeah. know inheritance of acquired characteristics then there's somehow configurations actually in the brain itself yeah, in some way some, or, some organic kind of harbor for them and then they're also like the platonic forms and I'm not and saying this I'm not saying the archetypes aren't an important idea they are but it's when he tries to nail it down exactly what it is although I mean in recent times or last 20 years or so there's been a lot of work in Jungian archetypes and evolutionary biology and mm. Lee Stevens was a Jungian um, a psychologist who bridged that gap and he's actually said there's more scientific evidence for something like the archetypes today than there was in, yeah, in Jung's own time so you know the, the, I mean you have to it's a century ago now that, that the stuff was being written about so science does advance and you're essentially it's essentially a, a discussion around pattern he has a Crowley problem which mm -hmm. is because he lived for so long and wrote so much mm -hmm. um, it depends what decade you can get him on that he'll actually uh, it, yeah, it exactly. Might, yeah. It might, it might be yeah, a yeah, yeah, sure. No, it's true. Sure. I mean, I mean, I mean, it was only towards the end of his life that he was well. He was asked to write something for a popular audience, and that's his contribution to man and his symbols. Um, but uh, when you said you were saying earlier, who who owns you? Know, yeah. Um, is it the, you know, the psychological, or the psychiatric, or the scientific, or the New Agers? Or, but I, I think certainly, you know, he was never really picked up by the mainstream intellectual. Um, world. I mean, yeah. if, if, if they liked anybody, it was Freud, you know. Uh, and but by the late fifties into the into well sixties, just just after he died, he was certainly picked up by the grassroots, um, you know, um, people, you know, who were interested yeah. in his ideas. You know, I mean, that's the thing. I, he even said that himself that you know uh, he felt that the common people who were more, more more interested in his ideas, and he talked about how people would come to his house at Kusnak and thank him for writing all these wonderful books you know I don't quite understand exactly what they mean but I know they're important and they've you know they've made the uh, they've meant a lot to me in my life and things like that so I think he felt you know he always wanted to be accepted you know that's this sure. is the, I mean the other thing he went on about that he wasn't was an artist yeah true. which gives it away if you know if you know the red book yeah if, if you know if you know um you know his stone carvings. I mean, he even built uh, a, a castle, castle. Yeah, you know, <laughs> bowling gym and all that. And people uh, don't realize that like, he actually learned how to get the stone, oh, like yeah. ship the stone oh, yeah. out of the quarry. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, he was a very physical character like yeah. that too. He was sort of military you know, man. He was a man's man in that mm -hmm. sense. You know, uh, very earthy. Uh, he's a very, very good cook apparently, uh, too. But uh, no, he went on and on. I mean, this is the whole. When he, well, depending on your point of view, either his descent into the unconscious or his psychotic breakdown after the yeah. break, break up with Freud, um, when he was plunging into the collective unconscious, or as he less often calls it, the objective psyche, which I think is a better yeah. a better term. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can go on to that in a bit. But he encountered these beings, you know, these people living inside his head and one of them was this woman's voice that he later said that this was his encounter with the anima she was telling he he asked her like what is it i am doing and this is when he was producing all these paintings and and you know this wonderful calligraphy in the red book um of these these visions he was having and, and she said it's art and he you know, no no it's not art and because he wants to he wants to be discovering these things not inventing them, yes. not, not creating them. He wants yeah. to be discovering them somehow. somehow. So, but, uh, I mean, as we all know, I mean, even Jung himself would say, you know, you are, yes, our dreams are part of this collective, or they can be, but they're also very, very personal. They're, yeah. uh, they speak in a symbolic language, but about you. It's not necessarily a symbol that you can apply in all cases. It's a symbol that is in the context of your own life. So even though Jung had these huge dreams, the big dreams, you know, as, as uh, they, they call them, they're also very much about him as well, and so I think there's, in some way, inherent there's a there's a difficulty there trying to separate. This is, I guess, this is the whole scientific kind of problem. You want to separate yourself from yes. your discovery so that it's real and objective and not just something that's relative to to me. And this is, you know, when you're an artist, it doesn't care. Yes, it comes out of you, but it has application to the larger world. But it, it, you know, it, its source isn't necessarily. In doubt, but I think this is a problem Jung, you know, had and struggled with, you know, throughout his life. That's so disavowing mystic and disavowing artist is the same thing because it. Do you forgive him for that? Like I, some, 
I get why. Do you know what I mean? Well, I think he was very canny. I think he was. Yeah. I, I, I think he had, you know, he had a good career sense in that sense. And I, I don't mean to dismiss him by this, but he, sure. he, was very, he was very strategic and tactical, and he played his cards close uh, to his chest. I mean, the story is that, uh, you know, he was experimenting with the I Ching as early as 1919, 1920, but he doesn't come out of the closet about it until, I don't know, 1949, is it? Mm. 1950, when that uh, edition of uh, Ricard Wilhelm's um, translation comes out, he writes the intro to it. So he's experimenting with the thing for 30 years, and he mentions it here and there, but it's not something that he, that he comes forth with. And the same thing like with the uh, uh, astrology. Yeah. I mean, he was doing, you know, casting horoscopes for his, his clients, and also, you know, for the West, Western civilization in general, that his late book Aeon is, is about that. And, um, and he's talking about the age of Aquarius in 1940. And, um, you know, so all this stuff was happening, but he kept it very close to his chest. And we were joking about it before. Um, he was doing, it was a one man 60s in the 30s. There are like, stories of people encountering him in his tower where he's like, dressed like essentially an, an exotic oriental alchemist mm -hmm. and he's mm -hmm. doing the I Ching and like essentially a back to the land movement because he built his own tower, oh, I Ching, yeah. astrology, he was doing the 60s, oh, 30s early. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, and all, all of that. So, and again, and, and also living, as you say, back to the land, I mean, he lived, lived in this tower in Roland, and he didn't have any electricity, he had to pump his own water, you know, chop his own wood and all this, all the, there was no heating. I think, I think towards the end, um, a real, a, Louise von Franz convinced him to put some sort of heating in because you know he was getting old and sort of needed it. But, but I mean, also, I mean, even a bit earlier because I mean, Jung was in this milieu in the uh, early 20th century, the 19 teens, um, where in uh, Switzerland uh, there was um, Ascona and there was Mount yeah. uh, uh, Monte Verita, Mountain of Truth, and this is where it, it kind of the cult, the counterculture began, as one book has it, and. Uh, people like Herman Hesse were there, and uh, Isidore Duncan. It was all back to nature, nudism, you know, health craze, health food sort of thing. This fellow Otto Gross was there, I mentioned earlier, with the uh, free love and cocaine and morphine. And uh, uh, Theodore Royce, who was sort of the, the head of the OTO, who mm -hmm. later got involved with Crowley, he was there and all this kind of stuff. So this was, and, and then in uh, Munich, um, Germany, the Schwabing district was another place. And if you ever read Richard Knoll's um, scandal this book, The Young Cult, which he's wrong about practically everything, but it's a very good read because it's about this milieu uh, in Monteverita and in, in Schraubing at this time, uh, just leading up to sort of World War I, um, where you have all this, it's like the beginning of the Volk mm -hmm. kind of sensibility and the back to nature sort of thing. And all that stuff comes around again, you know, I mean, it, nothing as new as what's no. uh, been done yeah. uh, before and it's cyclical because you can only go in so many sort of directions, you know, yes. you sort of, I mean, there's, um, I, I, I'm very keen on this distinction that, um, or this, uh, this uh, remark that the, the historian Arnold Toynbee made um, last century, where he said, uh, when uh, a, a culture is faced in its time of troubles and crisis, it, it has two sort of stereotypical ways to uh, react to it. It tries to recapture the past in some way, as the, the sort of what he calls the archaist movement. It goes back to the past, or it's the future is to the future. And so you sort of have that, you know, going on um, now. You have the whole transhuman, you know, a human, yeah. whatever it is, you know, we're extinct now, you know. Yes. Everybody, yeah. oh, oh, finally, Ooh, I'm glad that's over with. <laughs> <laughs> that's just off the hook. Yeah. Um, uh, or, you know, let's get back to off the grid, back to nature. We have to get rid of everything like that. And, um, yeah, I, I I would say, you know, uh, and Toynbee was someone who knew of Jung and they, 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 they knew each other's work and all that. So, um, yeah, I, I would say we're sort of going through something like that now. And I think mm. you can see evidence of the kind of reaction. Yes, so, definitely. You know? Definitely. So, all right. I think from a person perspective, because mm. uh, kind of coming back to, was he a good person? And just to hang it on, on the uh, affairs well, I mean, is... Like the, the bit I want to get to is yeah. he wasn't that great a father. Well, I, was, now you took the words out yeah. of my mind. I was thinking that because I mean I was going to say like his his um, his son tells a story of when his uh, when Jung was going through his um, turbulent time, descent to the unconscious, and he thought he was going mad. He kept a loaded pistol under his pillow, ready to blow his brains out if things got too bad. And his son said, do, do you know what it's like to grow up with a father who kept a loaded pistol under the pillow? Mm. Was, you know, if he had a bad dream, he was going to blow his brains out. And, um, and there's the whole 
as far as I understood it, they, uh, his immediate family, his sons, they were, I forget his name, I think the eldest son, he was very dismissive, apparently, about something like the Red Book. Um, the, pe he would, people would come and say, oh, this, this silly thing that my father put away or something, he would take it out and show it and not be, you know, particularly. I, I think, you know, you asked, like, who, who owned Jung or who owns him? I think that his family at one point, at least I could tell from what I've read, um, they felt that, that he had been taken from them Interesting. By, by the culture at large. He was no longer just, you know, their father. He had become this world guru, as it were, this, you know, famous, you know, he's on Time magazine, he's being interviewed on television, all this kind of stuff, and people were coming to the house all the time to see him, and, you know, the, he no longer belonged to them, and I think they resented that, um, mm. that, that, that sort of invasion of their privacy, as it were. You know? I think, I, and it, it is, it is taking, if, especially if it happens young, it's taking your father away, right? Because mm. um, mm. I think about that with, uh, in, like, the Tolkens, right? I think mm. the same thing, I think, um, the recently passed um, Christopher yeah, Tolkien, I think, Tolkien, yeah. I think a lot of his, what's perceived, and it, he did an amazing sunly job of, of putting all that kind of stuff that was never meant um, mm. for publication into an order and made it available for the world, right? But he was, he was always very precise and, and dismissive of when um, Tolkien's influence would get out of the canon and, right. and yeah. do stuff. And yeah. I think it's that same thing. I think if your father becomes, and it, it, at the same time too, in the 60s, if your father becomes a thing that is important and, and critically important mm. to counterculture, mm -hmm. then there's a psychological impact. Mm -hmm. Like the world took mm -hmm. my dad, yeah. basically. Yeah. Oh, well, there's, there's, there's a story. I mean, I don't know how true it is, but uh, uh, at one point, Jung, I mean, they, they, he was, wasn't around very much. This when his children were young, and then they... They finally got together on some Sunday outing and went boating or something like that. And um, he asks one of the children, "Who are you?" And he says, oh, "I'm your daughter." <laughs> Whatever her name was. So he, wow. he, he's like, "Oh, I forgot." So I mean, I don't know how true how true that is, but that, that story is told. So I mean, yeah, I mean, he, you know, I mean, you can find lots of uh, foibles with him and problems with him in that. But um, I think. Um, what can you say? I mean, I, in, in, in for the wor of world at large, the, he seemed a very congenial. Uh, I don't know if you've you must have seen that um, interview with him. Yes. Um, and you know, he's he's laughing, you know, all the time, and there's a kind of you know, not quite Santa Claus, but a kind of you know, uh, very vital, um, you know, very warm kind of sense coming out. So, uh, but you know, people's private lives have always become difficult and mm -hmm. problematic. So, why I why I wanted to frame it around. Um, the open question of who owns him is that there was this, a, a key event in publishing history is of mm. course whatever it is now 15 or so years mm. ago that um, the Red Book mm. was in fact mm. published which he didn't really want in his lifetime mm -hmm. and yeah. neither did the family and it took decades to come out and we, we've done a couple of shows about that before and it is a remarkable document but it's kind of like a um, BCAD moment mm. for Jung mm. right yeah. because it's it, it shifts um he went to all that effort, and more importantly, and I don't mean this in, mm. in too much of a negative way, but the lesser minds who came after him and built um, sort of Jungian analysis into, mm. into what it is, mm. have that need to kind of play dress-up scientists. Mm. Mm. And mm. all of a sudden you have this record of madness that's yeah, also like yeah. objective proof of a spirit world. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. so like, when I, it's uh, the question of, who owns him, and I, I don't think it's a final thing as much as I don't think in the maybe middle of the 20th century you could kind of, or even towards the end, say that you would look to official groups of, mm. of Jungian analysts to say this is canonical Jungian yeah. and this isn't. And I don't think that happens anymore. I think because of something like the Red Book, and that's why I wanted to have this show to kind mm. of discuss what I think his key concepts are. Mm. Not even in a, in a um, therapeutic sense mm. but ideas we, we'll start with collective unconscious obviously yeah. no I'll do a better one because what I want to do is I think I think he belongs to the world um, sorry kids but I think he belongs <laughs> to the world now mm. and and it's sort of dismissive to say oh he got taken up by the new age like that's not good enough because well if you're going to do that you, there's lots of stuff you got to chuck out there. yeah but, <laughs> so, but like it's, new age took up lots of stuff that uh, you know it was very good in itself and if it gets tarred with that brush well you know we're going to have to lose you know, a great deal of your library I think so exactly but, it, but it's also been um, influential on 
um, on films and oh, anthropology no, 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 no. and, and no, no. biology. No, no. So, like, Absolutely, yeah. when, and, and in that sense, I think we should let's start with this one because you kind of hinted at it before. Um, what are the, what are the archetypes? And mm. is it even one of this is controversial? Is it even one of his more important ideas? Well, the thing, I, I mentioned briefly um, earlier that uh, Jung, oh, not as often as I feel would have been better, uh, he uses this term objective psyche rather than collective unconscious. Mm. Um, because I guess for one, because collective, it, gen- it sort of means like it's like this all one kind of thing, or like we're, we all have kind of pipes, you know, hooked up to our heads. It's a big kind of you know vast reservoir of something like that. And I don't think that's quite what what, what he really meant. Objective psyche, I think, says it better because he's saying fundamentally there's parts of our interior interior world that have nothing to do with us. Mm-hmm. Right? It's it's not about us. It's not about you personally in that sense. I mean, if you so, um, I mean, when Swedenborg uh, was taken by the angels to heaven and hell and other planets, um, I would say he was in the objective psyche yeah. uh, too. And when uh, Henri Corbin talks about the kind of interior journeys that the Persian uh, Gnostic philosopher Surawardi went on, you know, they, they, these two were sort of journeys into the subjective psyche and. and Aldous Huxley, um, in uh, I think it's Heaven and Hell, he talks about uh, the mind has its own antipodes, its own, well, at the time he was writing the 50s, its own dark Africas and mm-hmm. Amazonian basins. And so, meaning there's, there's, on the surface, there's us in some way, whatever you're thinking about, your memories and, you know, whatever, all that kind of stuff. And then occasionally, we go in deeper, whatever metaphor you want to use or higher, and you enter something where what's happening in your mind is not necessarily just about you in, 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 in particular. So it's, it could be a, a parapsychological event, it could be a precognitive one, it could be a dream that's one of the big dreams or something like that. But this is something, and I, I think the, I, I, I think the, pro, the archetypes have the same problem that the platonic forms have. Like, where do you stop? Yeah. How many, is there an archetype for everything, you know what I'm saying? This was one of the things where I felt, because I, I mean, Jung was one of the first people I read. I, I, I read Memories, Dreams, and Reflection. I was about 14 or 15. I stole a copy from my high school library. I, I, I posted it back to them many years later. Oh, that's good. But I didn't leave, yeah. I didn't leave a note or anything, so they didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I got on to him from reading Herman Hesse, and um, you know, I was part of the, the Hesse craze in the early 70s, um, you know, millions of kids in the, the in the States and the UK were reading, reading all those books and Jung was always kind of associated with him. Um, and so, um, I, I, over the years I've read and, and a lot of, actually you know, written a book about him and all that, but I, oh, this, I, I never was quite comfortable with the notion of the archetypes because it was sort of like, it, it, it seemed too kind of packaged, mm-hmm. like there's this one and that one and that kind of thing. And the overall general idea that we don't come into the world yeah. um, of tabula rasa, that yeah, that, 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 that I, you know, I associate, I mean, I, 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 I understand that and I, I think that's true. We come equipped with, whatever you want to call it, some kind of, um, uh, you know, form, formative uh, design or something that reaches out into the world and gives it shape and, and things of that sort. So, I mean, but in a broader, in a broad sense, you can associate that sort of with phenomenology and intentionality yeah. and things of that sort, or even the Kantian category. So, I mean, there's all differences between all those things. Obviously, we could spend a lot of time, you know, uh, you know fine tuning it. But in general, rather than well, as I say in my books, you know, the, the standard idea of human psyche is sort of like it's an empty flat. And then you have to go to Ikea, buy a lot of stuff, you come home, you bring it in, and then, then it's furnished. So the senses are, are Ikea. You know, we, go, we you know, gradually take in stuff from the senses and we furnish our inner world. And Jung and uh, Plato and Goethe and Husserl and so many others are saying, actually, no, there's something in there in the first place, otherwise you wouldn't have a world. Yeah. You wouldn't. You need something to be able to give it shape and form and all that. So, on that level, I, I, I can. I, I think it's an important idea, and also the notion that in our deep interior we enter a realm that is not about us personally. And that's where Jung met, met these characters, you know, Salome and Philemon and Khan, well, yeah, and, and they, he spoke with them. I mean, he did go mad. He was doing things that people came to him about. Doctor, I'm talking to people in my head. Well, that's well, when did this start? Well, he was doing that himself, but he was doing it on purpose. You know, yeah. I guess he's kind of, you know, he's the wounded healer in that sense. You know, he, he 
the only way he could really understand madness and the, you know, the, the problems that people will be facing is for him to go, go through it himself and, and map it out. You know, so. I like the idea that it's probably a bit over-described. Mm. So uh, archetypes are... And I think that's a problem with Jung, again, because he's, he's trying to science things up, mm. right? Yeah. But it, um, it's also a function of the time. So if you look at something like the anima animus idea, it hasn't aged that well in the context of how we understand gender, for instance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. it's it's 110 years old, and if you look at it in that sense, even more, mm-hmm. um, and well, no, that's about fair. Um, but if you actually look at what a radical idea it was to say that um, a man has a woman in him, mm-hmm. like, fine, it's gender binary, which we, is, is not how we think with gender anymore, but it's actually a pretty impressive oh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. and I think yeah, the, the sure, archetypes yeah, are kind of yeah, so that's yeah. an example of it being over described and I know people because that's a criticism as well as the race stuff which we'll get to in a minute mm-hmm. I guess mm-hmm. that's a criticism people throw at him like the anima anim, animus idea is somehow terrible and I'm like no it's just out of it's just from a different time if you yeah. look at if, if Jung was doing this today let me tell you his understanding of say the trans experience would be um, actually, quite interesting, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's so hard. It's hard to say. I mean, yeah, I, 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 well, the thing is also, you know, you have whatever the contemporary concerns are uh, will come up. They'll be the thing most people are yeah. talking about, and so something like the anima idea, I, I can see where it can be. And it, it, it's not not only just now. I guess sort of in the seventies with the rise of feminism and all that, it was, it, it was something that became, yeah. and the whole idea that well, you know, ah. Uh, women are like this and all that yes and so on uh so but um still if you don't if 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 you can put aside those particular kind of definitions and and ways of looking at it and just learn uh, sort of experience that autonomy of what he calls the unconscious whatever you want to call it i think that's the main kind of thing you know however you want to map it out you know i mean i'm as i said i i don't I've been writing my dreams down. I mean, recently for this sort of, sort of uh, almost year and a half now, but o- over the years I've been I've been writing it down for you know forever. And um, um, I can't say that I ever started thinking about oh, what archetype was this, what things. Yeah. Like that. But it's sort of the story. I mean, the story that the dream sort of tells, and it, it's again it speaks in the symbolic language, and occasionally the symbols can be something that's bigger, you know, like larger, transcendent sort of thing. And I can see where he talks about the transcendent function, where there's some symbols in a dream. Can um, you know they they, they they combine opposites and they allow you to rise up above um, uh, what seems to be a problem that's mm-hmm. insoluble. You know, so the, you, you don't solve the problem; you rise up above, and it's no it's not a problem anymore. So I can see that process taking place, but it's it's not like the sort of archetype hunting kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, again, some people might find that useful. But myself, I've never I've never particularly found that um, uh, useful. So I just felt like you kind of put that aside. I mean, I, I think you can do that with all these uh, uh, thinkers, whether it's Jung sure. or Gurdjieff or Steiner or Crowley. Uh, you don't have to accept everything. And, and uh, Jung would be the first one to say is what's, what's important is what works. Yeah. And he said, I don't have a dream theory. I, I have no theory about dreams. I see what the dream is about. I, I see what, you know, what it's trying to say. And so I, you know, some basic ideas, but there's no particular kind of theory in the sense even like Freudians, uh, Freud's ideas or something like that. So it's like what works is what's important. So if the archetypes don't work for you, that's, you know, obviously that's fine, you know, don't worry about it. Yeah. So that's good. So do we need to, I think you're right about collective unconscious is a deceptive word for a very useful idea, potentially deceptive word for a very useful yeah, idea yeah, yeah. where objective psyche, because I, I remember this from um, first encountering Gnosticism five million years ago. Mm. Um, his definition of uh, gnosis was essentially um, a, a true un- a getting a true understanding of the psyche which is to say we're in it not mm. it's yeah, yeah, exactly. so yeah, if you yeah. talk like uh, objective psyche I like your redescription because again he uses collective unconscious and archetypes in in different ways to mean different things and and the actual profundity of this mm. concept can get lost or fumbled mm. in mm. that situation. Mm. Mm. Well, I said it's a kind of industry. I, yeah. I, I remember this is some time ago when I was uh, living in Los Angeles and I was working at uh, 
bookshop. There was a big metaphysical bookshop, and then there were endless books coming out about uh, the trickster or yep. the hag or the wise old man. And, and yeah, there's a lot of interesting things in it, but it was sort of like, you know, it was collect all 25 yes. kind of I like, thing, which, which, uh, I, which I felt a little like, you know, um, I, I felt it was sort of missing, you know, the main point, which I say for me was sort of the experience of the autonomy of. of, of these parts of ourselves, whatever we want to call it, the unconscious or the psyche or something. Uh, I think that's the important thing, and I think that's what Jung um, uh, realized was important too, developing a kind of real vital dialogue with it. And once that starts going, I mean, I'm not trying to sell Jung, but once you start experiencing that, you realize, oh yeah, okay, he was onto something. He was definitely, he was definitely onto <laughs> something here. It might not be the, the best uh, expositor of his own ideas, but he certainly was onto something. Yeah. All right. So for other important concepts, let's try it differently for the remaining ones, because that's one of them. And then we'll come back to almost trying to rank them. I know that's it's a game mm. rather than yeah, sure, anything else, sure. right? So other Jungian, I guess, insights or contributions mm. that we should both um, define, um, but then rank in terms of mm. importance. So we've got active imagination, we've done archetypes, mm -hmm. transcendent function, mm. individuation, the shadow and synchronicity. Mm, mm. So, good. I, but like, is, what, have I missed anything off that list in terms uh, of important contributions? Well, we can... I mean, it's, oh, it depends. You, you know, the the introvert and extrovert and all that. Mm. I mean, but we, can, yeah, but, I mean, a lot of the yeah, just like Freudian, Freudian slip. You know, this is something yeah. a lot of people might don't even know exactly what it means, but they, if it happens in life, they'll. Oh yeah, you know, it's, or, or like introvert and extroverts is kind of part of common, kind of common knowledge. And I think that's probably a complex and introvert extrovert are probably the Jungian terms that have had the widest, you know, spread in in the. Do you reckon more than synchronicity? Well, I think. Well, I mean, in the new age alternative world, yes, but somebody could say, "Oh, you've got a mother complex," okay, and they might not have ever heard of synchronicity. Yeah, but right. and they probably don't even know what the complex means. It just means that whenever your you know your mother comes up, you know, you you get angry or something like that. So, uh, and this was the stuff he did early on. The complex is what he and the complex. This is from his word association test, and this is the hard statistical, experimental science that he had his roots in. So I, that's another difference between him and Freud. Freud's clientele were a particular, you know, strata of, of Viennese society, and Jung was working in a mental asylum, yeah. you know, for a good 10 years, uh, more or less, and, you know, engaging with real, you know, uh, there were some serious very, schizophrenic Yeah, some really, I remember characters from your you, book, yeah. there's some really, really interesting People were a special kind of mad. Like they thought they lived on the moon. Oh yeah, yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Like yeah, that's yeah. really, really mentally yeah. unwell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's. Uh, I mean, that's the thing. And it's that he sort of have wider kind of clinical experience than mm. than Freud. I mean, Freud was big, and the, the, the private clients of a particular kind, of, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, but I, I would say, yeah. I mean, complex introvert, extrovert. You know, we the, 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 the people like to go to the parties, and there's people like to stay home. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's sort of about. <laughs> About it, but I've um, but uh, no active imagination. I, I think this is one of his uh, most important ideas, and it's um, it's a kind of Jungian practice. It's something yes. you can do. You know, uh, you can write down your dreams, which is uh, uh, the the other sort of main practice. But um, I mean, dreaming sort of happens to yeah. you. Um, I think Jung would have been a bit critical of the whole idea that we can kind of manufacture our dreams, a sort of lucid dream industry or so, which I'm, you know, again, I'm not against it in any way, but Jung would say dreams are, uh, dreams are a natural expression of the psyche. So it's a natural sort of manifestation of our other self, other part of us, and to kind of start trying to guide that process is the ego getting in to where the self is and kind of, you know, manipulating and, and not, you know, not sort of hearing what that, because um, you know the, the main the main Jungian idea, although he said he didn't have the theory, but the main Jungian idea of dreams is comp the, the compensatory. So yeah. if you have a very very specific um, attitude in your conscious life, it, it, it may be too one sided, and your dream will. You know, and it doesn't have to be bad, you know, and good. It could be you know you you, you may be ignoring good things about yourself, and your dream can can tell you them. I mean, we, we tend to think it's you know the other way around. Um, but active imagination is basically it's a way of dreaming while you're awake, um, and it's very much related to 
something that we all experience twice a day, uh, hypnagogia, which is this in-between sleeping and waking state. And Jung was a very good hypnagogist. Uh, mm. to, if, if you read Memory, Dreams, and Reflections, he talks about that, um, you know, this sort of in-between state, seeing visions. Uh, it's a way of sort of getting into that state consciously, on purpose. It's, it's kind of meditative. Uh, but instead of shooing away so the fantasies that would come up, as one would do in kind of meditation, because you don't want to focus on that, you actually engage, you pick one of them, and you engage with it in some way. And as Jung did in his Descent into the Unconscious, the aim is to see if you could have a dialogue with this fantasy, because the fantasy too is a kind of spontaneous expression of, of the psyche, of the objective psyche, let's say. And um, you can have a conscious waking dialogue exchange with it. And there's still some people, I mean, Jung, that's what he was doing in the Red Book. I mean, he, and he has these fantastic adventures and stuff like that. There's no guarantee you're going to have the same kind of roller coaster yeah. ride, but that's the idea. But some, just stick figures. <laughs> <laughs> but some, some people have, have, have accounts, and there's you know, different Jungian analysts that, that have you know, published accounts of different you know, clients who have engaged in this. Bit of a camera error there, but we were, I think you, before the camera rudely interrupted us by getting too hot, <laughs> you were going to uh, talk about transcendent function. Yeah, transcendent, list. yeah, transcendent function. Uh, I think this is the other very important idea of Jung's, and it's, it's related to active imagination. And um, transcendent function is fundamentally the unconscious, this ability to come up with the symbol that is able to reconcile uh, what seem to be irreconcilable opposites. And if uh, you find yourself in some insoluble situation where uh, you can't choose between one or the other, both, you know, there's no way out, both, both uh, options uh, seem bad choices. Uh, and if you can endure that sort of tension, um, a dream may produce a kind of symbol that brings the two things together in some way uh, and creates a third. Uh, tertium non datum, or uh, I guess you know the Hegelian kind of you know thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Uh, it's very similar, although Jung is saying it's on a psychological level, and it's transcendent in the sense that not in transcendental meditation or or um, some cosmic sort of way, but in the sense that it it, it raises the consciousness up above the problem. So you don't necessarily find a solution to the problem, but what had caused you panic and, and you know, grave concern and, and was driving you crazy, suddenly you see it from a different perspective. You, you rise up above it. And this is one of the things that he spells out in this introduction to the secret of the golden flower. And he yeah. talks about one of his um, clients um, uh, experiencing this. And uh, this whole idea about somehow, uh, it's, it has a sort of image of, it's as if you're on a mountaintop and you can see a storm below you. So the storm is still going on, but you're not in it, and you're, you're up above it. And essentially it's about broadening your perspective. You know, some, some problem that had you gripped like this and you couldn't get out of, suddenly your consciousness has opened up to wider perspectives. More meaningful sorts of horizons open up, and you can see something that... Uh, so, I mean, you know, it could be something as simple as suddenly becoming interested in something, and, and you, you're fascinated with it, and you realize, oh, what was I so worried about? And, oh, that doesn't seem such yeah. a big problem anymore because you've the energy that had been sort of bottled up in that um, conflict has been released by, 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 the, by the symbol in the dream, and it, it's, it flows into consciousness. And so this is the sort of thing that Jung would say that he, was, he would be trying to lead his, his, his clients toward, to somehow endure the conflict long enough for the tension to produce this, this kind of reconciling symbol. It's, it's um, one of the things that I think is... Uh, it, profound in its implications because what he's saying is that there's a part of the human that is not its thoughts <laughs> that um, in that sense it is cosmic like it's literally mm -hmm. transcended yes. there's a thing in you so first of all the objective so uh, thoughts predate you and so the, the world of the mind is at least in some large part not you. So there's mm. an objective mindscape or spiritscape, and also there's a part of the human mm. that is not its thoughts that can do this. So it's yeah, actually yeah. like it is quite profound. <laughs> well, no, no, it, it, it's 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 yeah, it's, uh, terrifically profound. And uh, I mean, what, it's you said it earlier. It's like you know, we think of the mind or the psyche as something in us, but it's we are in it. Yes, and that would be the, one of the turnarounds that um, uh, should come about. 
as you become more acquainted with the autonomy and the intelligence of the psyche, whatever yeah. you want to call it. I mean, I, again, I'm not trying to sell this, but I know from my own experience from recording dreams and a variety of different things that whatever it is, it is actually, it's very intelligent it's, and it's, it's clever and it, is, yeah. it could be very funny. It all could be very, very uh, frank and straightforward and, 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 and give you the message, you know, clear as day. Sometimes it's so clear that you miss it because you're looking for something yeah. deeper and more esoteric when it's just, you know, fundamentally, you know, get your act together or something like that. And uh, this is this other part of us that's not us. It's in the sense that it's not your verbal left brain ego that is, is uh, identifies with language you know, the ego we, we identify with being able to speak and and that other side of us doesn't use language but it uses symbols or mm. pictures or metaphors or plays on words or jokes and things of that sort it's, it's almost like a rebus kind of something you know and if you learn how to read you know there's a word and then there's an image of something you know uh, and then something else and you you put those things together and this is this was for me the, the kind of turning point was when I was looking at dreams and all that, and I suddenly realized, oh God, now I see what that means. It's like, it's, it's saying something, yeah, it's very important, but it's sometimes very, very simple. And it, it's, it's said in, in words. Uh, I mean, it's, it's said not in words, it's said in images and, and symbols and, and, and pictures. It's a pictorial kind of language. Um, and then so whatever it is, it's, it's, it's intelligent. And the, I, I feel bad saying it, because it's more of a who yeah. uh, than an it. I mean, this is, again, we tend to think of it this way because we're, we're trying to be scientists and you know look at it objectively and all that but actually as you more and more engage you realize it is part of yourself i mean maybe it's the right brain or maybe it's not the right brain but it is some other part of ourselves that is not the verbal i and and again we are actually in it more than it's it's not like oh it's over there yeah it's kind of like we we're like you know we kind of pop out of it exactly. our, our sense of, yeah. of being an independent eye we kind of pop out of it uh, and you can associate this with the Gnostic kind of whole myth of, of the demiurge who thinks it's the god you know sees the world it's created I must be and it has no idea that it's actually part yeah. of or, or subordinate to some higher larger intelligence and uh, this is something E. McGilchrist you know has been talking about the uh, master his emissary in terms of the left and right brain where you can read the same kind of conflict or uh, you know tension between those two or situation in in terms of the Gnostic kind of myth uh, yeah. as well and, and Jung's you know relation between the ego and the self I mean I guess where where Freud would say uh, where it was there will be ego I guess for Jung we would say where there ego is there will be self it's going to moves and there's a difference there too because Freud's it is some nasty bestial dark yes. horrible kind of thing that we all want to keep in the closet and Jung's self is this fount of creative energy and vitality and vision and all that so he had a much more positive optimistic view of the unconscious than Freud did yeah cool so next one I think this is the well there's some minor ones but mm. the next big one we want to mm. hit to stack them so do you think it is synchronicity right mm. so okay let's let's say what that is and then we'll try to rank <laughs> <laughs> Whether collective unconscious transcendent function, synchronicity, and active imagination are well, like they're, in they're what, all sort of parts of the same they, thing. That, too, that, that was the bit. Kind of like pseudopodia coming yeah. out. We yeah. see them appearing through different cracks, but actually behind yeah. all that, there's. You're words. spoiling the end of the show. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but no, synchronicity, uh, meaningful coincidence. That's the simplest way to, to, I would say, you know, when something going on in here, something in the outer world. Um, uh, connects uh, not in any causal kind of way one making the other happen but through a meaningful I, I had one just the, uh, recently I was uh, on my way to give a talk at the Theosophical Society here on uh, Colin Wilson uh, and uh, naturally if you know Colin Wilson's work the book everybody knows is The Outsider and I did the, the, it was a two-part talk, and the, the first part was about um, his early work, The Outsider, and he wrote all these books called The Outsider Cycle that nobody knows about but are really important, uh, and so on. And on my way to the Theosophical Society, I stopped at my local market to pick up something, and I was in the queue, and there was the magazine rack at the checkout stand, and I look over, and there's a, it, you know, it's a kind of stack, stack, stack like that, and in between two other magazines, there was um, the March issue Vogue, and everything else was blocked on the cover, except for the 
title, The Outsider. Yeah, very good. And I later looked up, it was about a pop singer, uh, Billie Eilish or something. I, I, I don't know, I have the slightest idea. So I, I didn't even peek over and see what it was about. I just looked over and I said, okay, right. Yeah. I'm on my way to talk about The Outsider and there you go. So there's a little tap on the shoulder saying, you know, you're on the right path or things are going okay. So uh, things like that happen often. And um, Can I give you one that just happened yeah, to me yeah, an yeah, hour ago? By, by so means, I was in yeah. Treadwells um, where I'm speaking tomorrow. Yeah. And I look in the Pacific section, and there's a, a book that's spine out, so it's not front facing. Yeah. And it says, Gordon, the embarrassing Australian. <laughs> <laughs> they knew you were coming. <laughs> yeah. so they, they put, but it's like, it's an old yeah. book. It's an old secondhand book. And it, um, oh, had, had you known of this book before? Yeah, it's, it's about oh, actually a, um, uh, a, well, famous is the wrong word, but an historic uh, Australian Aborigine who was in the military. But oh, like, wow. but um, it just says Gordon the embarrassing Australian fair and travels and like so obviously it's going to go great. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that's like, fantastic! Wow, meaningful yeah, so. coincidence, right? Um, it's one of the another one that's profound in its implications because it's almost like where the oh. if we're embedded in the psyche. Oh. Um, so is everything else. Mm. So actually mm. that's how synchronicity works, mm. right? Mm. Which is essentially mm. that there is an interiority to all things. Like, so a thought that it, um, appears in my mind is can, can also appear in a thing in it, what mm. we perceive to be the mm. Like, mm. that's why when we, when we say meaningful coincidences, Jung has this incredible, like, hermetic cosmology, mm. Mm. right? And, and there are just these ideas that are almost like, or terms that are icebergs. So yeah, yeah, we say, yeah, yeah. and they all kind of come down onto this, yeah, this yeah. thing, which is where in the mind and ideas, essentially yeah. where in the mind ideas of spirit, this stuff is all real and the universe is well, alive. He, well, he talks, he talks, well, he has this notion of the psychoid, which is, you could say it's some sort of liminal state between matter and, and psyche. Um, I mean, he coins the term, so I mean that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the case, but it's no, sort of yeah. he wants to. I, but I think again, Jung is he's not the best person to go to to try to understand synchronicity, Good point. because in the book that you know he wrote about it, and he shared the uh, book with Wolfgang Pauli, who who, who uh, had his own sort of thing about it as well. Um, he really only gives one clear example of synchronicity because it became it becomes a kind of umbrella term that he uses for all paranormal events. So he mm-hmm. tries to understand precognition and uh, whatever, clairvoyance and a variety of other sorts of things in terms of synchronicity. And it becomes a kind of deus ex machina almost Mm -hmm. that he pulls out all the time. Uh, And again, he's trying to be super scientific in this as well. And you can understand because he's talking about basically how, you know, these things that most rational people would just rack up to coincidence, so isn't that strange, but well, statistically, you might think that might happen, blah, blah, blah. It isn't that strange. He's saying, no, 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 there is some, some other, a causal connecting principle, which mm-hmm. Arthur Kessler pointed out as a meaningless phrase. It means a cause that isn't a cause. Uh, so, but, you know, in a sense, he said it's things are connected by meaning, by, by not, uh, not in any kind of cause and effect um, uh, relationship. And uh, it suggests to me is, you know, that we, we think, we've thought this about the mind, I guess, you know, since the rise of, science, uh, this Cartesian separation between mind and, and the world, but actually they participate in some way, which we don't really understand. Yes. We, we, we've been told about this by quantum physics telling us that, like, well, you know, there is no plate glass window between the observer and the observed. You know, I just wrote a piece about this for uh, the web journal, and, and this is Heisenberg's sort of thing. You know, we the very act of observing something, we interfere with it in some way. Um, so we know that, but still, in everyday life, we kind of like, oh well, yeah, that's 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 those elementary what's it's do that. But we we know there's mm. a clear separation between what's happening here and what's happening out there. But apparently, there isn't. Most of the time, there is, and, and it's good that there is. We we you know the Berks, Bergson idea that the brain is a, a filter. You know, it it uh, it, uh, it it has an eliminatory function. You know, it filters out stuff. Yeah, uh, and. There's lots of studies about people under psychedelics. They seem to have more synchronicities happening or more kind of paranormal events happening. So in one sense, we're probably awash in this kind of stuff. But in order to get on with things, we have to filter it out. And every now and then, you know, one pops through. Now, the strange thing is that it pops through in some way that's meaningful to you in particular. This is the really weird stuff. It's not just some, you know, there's lots of examples of strange coincidences. 
uh, the, 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 the French gentleman in the plum pudding is one of the famous ones where he always shows up and the other guy orders the plum pudding and it's sort of like that happens so coming, many times coming it's like to the coronavirus <laughs> <laughs> alright yeah, yeah. 1983 yeah, 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 Dean yeah, yeah. Kutz book yeah, 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 yeah. about a virus from Wuhan oh well there you go so I mean, yeah. well, the, 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 uh, you know the wreck of the Titanic exactly and, and all that yeah. but then there's ones that are like micro you know channeled to you in particular and it's like who knows that who, who knows that? How did that copy of Vogue yes. get there? Why did I go in then? Yeah. And at that point... To and, be at the part of the queue that saw the magazine... And the strange thing was, I later had... I forgot something. I had to go later on in the day to get something. Went in the same queue, and they had changed the magazines. Yeah. So it wasn't there. <laughs> so if I didn't go at that time, Wouldn't I would not have seen all. it at all. Yeah, so, I like it. I, and that's when you start to think, okay... And then when you say it, is up there. when it is so much more intelligent than you, yeah. that's when you get like how how do you well, how do you arrange because for that to well, have worked, yeah. you had to arrange the universe well, from the yeah. point of its creation well, this is to where you. It's very very difficult. <laughs> this is where the rational mind says, okay, do you think that some super consciousness is there, make putting things together in such a way that you would be there at that time to see that magazine? I mean, yes. <laughs> well, do you have a better <laughs> do you have a better way to account for it? But, you know, yeah. so I mean, and it's, it's you know we the mind boggles at the you know at that. So. so the last one is, and I think in many respects this might be at the bottom of the list. And I'll ask this question mm. in mm. a different way. So let's talk. Give us a definition of individuation, and uh -huh. if you think it even exists. Well, it goes back to um, what is it? The Greek poet Pindar: "Become who you are." Sure. Nietzsche talks about that as well. You know, I can't homo. Become, become who you are. You know, we're, we're, we are, or you know, we're, we have potentia in us, and it's making it actual in some way. So I would guess, yeah, individuation. I mean, Jung, in Jungian terms, it's basically lining up your archetypes so that so you you have a relationship with them and you go through the sort of process and it's, it's, it's usually the shadow is the first one you encounter it's all the stuff about yourself that you don't recognize or you know don't want to admit and that kind of thing and you have to face that and um, then you mentioned the anima you know you encounter the opposite contrasexual side of your of your psyche whatever that might be uh, and th those are sort of the big first three ones and this is on the way to encountering the self which is um, the total psyche the ego is just a ego is a very very brightly lit um, part of the psyche and this is you know its job is basically to give direction you know, out in the world and to under you know to uh, guide us you know through the world and consciousness but you know it it's become unaware of the rest of it that it's attached to and the whole process of individuation is to become full to, you know, total, you're a fragment. Was, if you're just aware of ego consciousness, you're still a fragment. It's become total. And it's also, as mentioned about Jung being, you know, advised to throw off bourgeois conventionality, it's also about finding your own way, becoming who you are. You know, not, you know, not, this was when I was a kid when I first was reading Sons. Yeah, that's what I, you know, because I, I caught the tail end of the 60s, do your own thing and, you know, march to the beat of a different drum, all that kind of stuff. And Jung was sort of saying that. So, you know, what, you know, what, what is that about? You know, who, who are you and not, you know, part of the uniform masses and you're, you're, you know, you find your own way in the world and don't follow the dictates of society and all. I mean, this, yes, becoming who you are can sadly be an excuse for license and just yeah. uh, you know so but I, I, I've written yeah. I've written about I that just, yeah, I, 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 to be a drunk yeah yeah, yeah. well yeah, yeah. I've, I've read about that in the context of someone like like uh, Crowley because you know become who you are and do what that will they're not too far apart and, and the whole idea of finding your true will would be the same kind of thing as individuating mm -hmm. but it, it, sadly it, it can often be used as an excuse for you know but Jung is very again it's a shame that he wasn't clear about this, but in one of his early papers, when he is talking about individuation, I talk about it in the book, I forget the title of it now, but um, he does say that an individuator, it's not enough for them to throw off the constraints of you know, bourgeois conventional, conventionality and society's norms. They have to be able to adopt and manifest an even higher law and even exactly. more seriousness yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, about it. Otherwise, they're, they're, they're good for nothing. They're just mm. based. And again, this is Jung had a negative idea about artists because the artists that he knew of at the time when he was developing ideas, they were the Bohemians and, you know, they weren't very industrious. They kind of, whatever, you know, they may paint, they might not paint, or they might not write a poem or something. And he was very, he was very industrious, efficient, 
you know, a workaholic, he got things done. So the whole idea of these artists had a negative um, kind of deadbeat character for him. So when he's talking about the individuators, it's not, it's not just society's misfits. It's not just people who can't, you know, get with the program uh, or just decide to live by their own law. They actually, they take on an even more severe and austere kind of discipline, which is the law of their own being. So it's, it's not what your conscious, not what your conscious mind chooses. Exactly. That's the other thing. It's not yeah. like, ooh, I, I identify as this and I identify as that. It's not about that at all. It's, it's about sort of taking on the challenge of kind of giving up the ego's autonomy yes. uh, and to be able to hear, you know, uh, a, a, a kind of uh, rule in a certain way, a, a kind of direction and guide coming from something deeper within yourself. And again, you can't, you can't take someone's temperature to know whether that, that's actually happening or not. And it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to gauge and see what happens. So there is a thin line, you know, there's a thin line between, it's this thing about the antinomian, you know, uh, where you, you, you're beyond good and evil, you know, you're beyond the norms. Well, you can be on the norms as a sinner and you can yeah. be on the norms as a saint. And it's not too easy all the time to know which is which. This is the caution that uh, Jung, Jung gives about this. So he was aware of that problem. And Nietzsche was as well, too, mm. you know. Well, because, I mean, oh, we probably don't have time for it this time, his, his philosophical mm. um, uh, influences. But mm, mm. So, um, so the thing about individuation for me, you mentioned Crowley as another example of become who you are. I'm just wondering, it's almost like because a lot of people, mystic spiritualist mm, mm, mm. types throughout history, have said, something like that the weird thing about it it's, it's Gnostic right like mm -hmm. um, some of the early Gnostic well the early Gnostic groups, some of the Gnostic groups were uh, would argue as would early Christians about whether you could be saved or not whether it was forgotten mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um, whether there was any point in uh, mm -hmm. using whatever Christian right. ritual right. gives you salvation because God had decided yeah if yeah. you were saved or not yeah and there's something about individuation that reminds me <laughs> of that which is mm. is it is it either going to happen or not well Jung, Jung says it's a natural process yeah and going through Jungian uh, analysis of therapy or you know doing active imagination these things can speed it up so it's much like alchemy alchemy speeds up natural processes uh it, it's it's what nature is doing but we're doing it a lot quicker um so that sort of thing and um well the thing is I don't think it's predestined because he would say like uh, the problem with with modern man is that we're we're not individuated and be becoming who you are again as I said it's not necessarily a conscious decision and it's 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 developing a real vital living dialogue with the unconscious with that the other parts of the psyche that we're not conscious uh, of or or, or or engaged with and so it's filling 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 out um, yeah. um, y your own your own inner world uh, and um, I I don't think I would say for you know, it wouldn't be predestined at all because you said it, it, it requires a certain effort you know it, do, it happens naturally See. but in the same way like well you know well, G.K. Chesterton, the, the, the English writer, said why, he always wondered why there were so many brilliant children, why were there so many dud adults? So when you're, oh, you're I see, the yeah. children, is everyone, yeah, yeah. Oh, the potential is there, and, and by the time you sort of hit a certain age, you know, you, 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 you've gone through the normal kind of uh, stages of life, but you haven't carried that you know, further. Life takes you a certain distance. He would so say. that would be predestined, do you know what I mean? Some people get it and some people don't. Well, I mean, well, well, I know, but not everybody's a great violinist, yeah. right? But we can appreciate what they do, and we can have deep experiences by, you know, listening to their music and all that, so... Um, I just, like, for me, how to say this, it's the... Ter it's not, not that I just, I, it is a perfectly valid... Um, description of a uh, of becoming who you are as a fulfillment of dreaming so I think mm, of it in mm, Aboriginal mm, concepts mm, like mm. you the Aboriginal version of that would be to fulfill those dreamings which are seeking expression in you mm, right yeah, sure, um, yeah. so do you, this is what I mean like is it it was it an important contribute is individuation an important contribution to the world if we already kind of have that idea do you know? Can I put it at the bottom of the list? Well, because, am I, am well, I just well, being I, mean I, to it? I, I, strangely enough, for me, I, I, I've always it was always been an important idea for me because I just like that idea. And, and he said it. Other people, Nietzsche talks about it. Schopenhauer talks about it. This whole idea of, be, well, Jung, in the bit from the Red Book days that he did um, some, uh, give to some people to read so this thing called the Seven Sermons to the Dead. Mm. It is a Gnostic kind of track, and it's about 
distinguishing yourself from the pleroma. So there's the all, where everything is undifferentiated and indistinct, it's part of the all, and then the process of, in, well, in, in, to individuate, to become yourself, to become, to become a whole. You could say it's becoming the microcosm, in the macrocosm, you know. I mean, we, all, we all are potential microcosms, because um, according to hermetic ideas, we all in some way reflect mm. the cosmos as a whole. We have that which is in the cosmos is also in us in some way, as above, so below, and so on. But we don't all, and no one is stopping anybody from doing it. It, it requires effort. I mm. mean, and you know, I, am I? I have no idea. You know, I mean, that's that's one of the first things people say. Well, do you think you're into it? I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm. I, I like to think I'm working on it, but apparently it's a lifelong, you know, task, this, and I, I, I have no, I have no, I, I have no idea. But I, I don't. It's one of the things that seems like worth something worthwhile to, to, to you know, put my energy into. So you know. All right, all right. Let's but I mean, what, what do you want to say? I mean, are you saying like, well, it's not democratic, or it's, it's, no, no, no. It's, 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 it sounds elite I just, I or think, something no, like that. No, I think there are. I think. I resonate with other descriptions mm. of the same process. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So I think that's what I mean. Whereas, for instance, um, synchronicity and even collective unconscious, mm. as we've mm. discussed mm. it here, there are some terms or ideas, or Jung in his lifetime mm. put some cosmic notions sure, together sure. in a way that are really fucking well, useful. Well, well, there's, well, there's, there's, you know, there are post Jungians who took argument with individuation. James Hellman was one of True. those, but he, you know, he was cozying up to. Um, Derrida and and the deconstructionists. So the idea of ooh, you know, things being whole was no, no, no. We're all supposed to be fragments yeah. now and bits and pieces, and there isn't uh, the self that we're you know, no, no, this uh, you know, a whole you know variety or uh, uh, so. But I, I you know, I, you know, it's all. I, I, as I was saying, you can find. Well, I think historically. The process of so many ideas and counter ideas and critiques and commentaries on those ideas and post 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 something is just sped up in recent years. So mm -hmm. it's uh, in some ways you have to kind of push all that stuff away to get down to what Jung or, or any or any of these major thinkers are saying. Yeah. You can buy the latest book on Nietzsche, and I don't know. There'll be no Nietzsche. I'm just going to tell you about yeah. Nietzsche. I'm yeah. going to tell you about what the 25 guys before that guy <laughs> said about Nietzsche. And again, Nietzsche's another one who talks about the, the same thing: become who you are, uh, Eke Homo. But also in his early, very early essays, I think it's Schopenhauer, Educator. He talks about if you want to know who you are, look to your heroes. Look to what what have you loved. So he's not talking about it in a psyche kind of you know Jungian way. He's saying look look at your life hitherto. Like what you know what has moved you? What has you know been very important to you and all that? Because and that it, it's through engaging with that that you will find out who you are. And again, Nietzsche is also for Nietzsche the self or you. You're, it's not you don't find yourself as if you misplaced it. You know you you make a self over time. So there's a bit more of a creative aspect in Nietzsche's idea of become who you are. Your certain potential, but there's there's effort choices. A, a creative uh, engagement with 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 the world that enables you to to bring that about. So it's not so much find. I think this is one of the differences too. I think Jung too. It often sounds like oh you find yourself, but it's not. It isn't finding it. You somehow work your way towards it. You kind of make. It's a kind of co-create, co-discover, co-create kind of process at the same time. Mm. I would say. Okay. All right. So let's rank them. Let's let's play this game. <laughs> okay. All right. So most important contribution is either collective unconscious slash objective psyche or um, synchronicity or active imagination let's put them on the podium right so number one well in a certain sense i think it depends important in what way you mean culturally uh, at large or what, what 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 as they say today what is the take what is the what is the takeaway from this from Jung? i mean i i would say the transcendent function because all you have to do is pay attention to your dreams. All right. You don't have to buy any theory about them at all, except you know the idea that they do communicate in a pictorial language. Pay attention to your dreams. Pay attention to what's going on in your life, and you can you that way. I think you could see the autonomy cool. of this, and that would lead on to objective psyche, whatever you want to call it. I mean, Jung didn't give a name for it, but. His approach to the unconscious, I would say, is probably the most important thing because yeah, okay, that's the, you know, we kind of still have this notion of the unconscious, Freudian unconscious, and some nasty kind of stuff with all that bad stuff in there. And it's like, well, no, actually, it's it's your friend and ally mm. who's just you know, metaphorically a few you know, micrometers away from one side of your head to the other, and it's, it's infinitely patient. 
infinitely helpful. It's always ready to, you know, it'll say the same thing to you dozens of times and, you know, until you finally get it. Well, if we, if we make approach to the psyche, the most, like, yeah. most, if we put that on the top of the list, yeah. that means we can fold active imagination yeah, and yeah. transcendent yeah, exactly. function yeah, yeah. together. Yeah. So that's good. All right. That's, yeah. that's it. So it's the approach to the psyche and then it's the objective psyche. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so we've, we've gone from a list of five down to two. Is mm. that? Mm. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Because they say it's sort of like they're all, they're all yeah. connected. Um, and I, I would say culturally, probably... <sighs> Probably co collective unconscious and synchronicity. I would have to say, kind of mm. neck and neck, you know, because um, a lot of people would. I think people would say, "Oh, a synchronicity," and not quite know exactly what it's. It's the word to use instead of coincidence. Yes, kind of now. Yeah. So they'll they'll say that, and they might have you know, fifteenth hand idea of what it, yeah. what it means. Um, I, collective unconscious is less immediately. Uh, something we run into in, in everyday life. Well, well Jung would say it, it's you know it's pushing us around all the time, but in terms of something actually happening, it doesn't come up in too many business meetings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So like, oh, a synchronicity would come up. Or yes, something. Like, that's yes. what. Let's go with that. In, in my good. head, in my head, that's literally memories of meetings where yeah. words like synchronicity have come up, yeah. and they have been used. Wrong is unfair. Yeah. but they have gotten 15 hand description yeah, yeah, yeah. coincidence is like a bad word now it's like a scooby doo ending right, right. where it turns out the ghost is a gardener like right, yeah, coincidence yeah. is a word that you use if you're one of those horrible over explaining right, okay. types like right, that right, is mere right. coincidence right, right, right. but the polite way of saying it now is synchronicity right. even if people <laughs> don't know what it means right yeah there you go all right no that's good all right so approach to the psyche and then objective psyche so we went from my confusing list of five or six <laughs> down to two, but I think we nailed it. I think you're right. I think so, so, his I, approach was, yeah, the, was yeah. really revolutionary. Uh, well, he's one of the first ones in the psychotherapeutic world to, you know, sort of look at the unconscious as something that's... Um, it, 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 it wasn't just a place where you put a lot of stuff. I mean, Freud, yeah. Freudian theory, you can actually empty out the unconscious at some point. If you go through everything, you haul all that stuff that's in there out bring it out to light a day you become aware of it and then it's empty you've got an empty room you have an empty basement whereas Jung it's like it's like you're trying to empty the ocean it's not it's not a basement you know it's you know we, we have little puddles of consciousness in our metaphorically in our heads but they are in some way connected through streams and eddies and you know uh, tributaries to I, I just said earlier I didn't like that as Mitchell, I'm going to use it now to some larger kind of infinite ocean of things, and and you know the way in is the way to these other worlds. I mean, these other dimensions. Where else? Where else could they possibly exist? These yeah. other dimensions or spiritual realms that we talk about in the esoteric world. Where else could they possibly exist? But deeper within, in some way, you know. I mean, they're not out there anymore. This is again. That's that's another thing. It's only. It's only relatively a few hundred years when we stop thinking like oh it's out oh, yeah. there somewhere you know far yeah. far away out there it's like uh, no it's it's far far away in here in some strange way mm -hmm. and uh, I mean I think every I think in many ways I mean, it may not be as should say it may not be specifically out of any particular book of Jung's or, or writing but just in the general sense I think he is the one that turned us around and said look look inside you know look inside you and you know, for the answers to the questions you seek and that kind of thing, it sounds like it sounds like some Eastern guru. But I mean, that's basically what he was doing. And many, many people, at least from my generation, and the, the, maybe the, uh, the people ten years uh, younger than me, uh, ten years older than me, uh, you know, they started that interior journey with a copy of Jung. You know, man, the symbols, or you know, modern man in search of a soul. You know. Good. Les Leslie How the actor Leslie Howard in the film The Petrified Forest with. Uh, Humphrey Bogart and Betty Davis. If you know the film, he there's a line where he says he's walking. He has a copy of Modern Man, in search of a soul, um, when he's walking around in the desert there. So, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah so. good. Depending on when you were listening to this, this one is a couple of days late, and I wasn't actually sure why that was the case. Um, like many of you, I'm stuck here, so I theoretically had the time 
but uh, it just didn't feel right. And then Sunday morning rolled around, Palm Sunday specifically. And I think this one wanted to come out during and for Holy Week. Uh, in the story of Jung's creation of the Red Book specifically, um, I think that is the magically operant road into encountering biblical beings and being enriched from the experience. So if you listen to this during Holy, Me- Holy Week, it may be... Uh, um, top of mind, um, well, top of conscious and top of unconscious for you, right? But the other thing that happened is I got to the end of the fifth Earthly book on my audiobook listen through, which I've mentioned before, right? And the foreword for this one, um, Tales from Earthsea, is actually at the end in, uh, in the audio version, right? And in the strange way of Ursula's wisdom, it was the perfect thing for me to hear right now. And, uh, and an additional layer of wisdom for these times when it comes to turning that friendly face to one's unconscious. Um, And that is a deeply, profoundly urgent thing at this moment, this inward escape, uh, when the outward ones are prevented. And it calls to mind, obviously, um, one of her uh, most often quoted lines, which is, the direction of escape is toward freedom. So what is escapism an accusation of? Anyway, I'd like to read you a little bit of the forward. Actually, it's about half the forward. <laughs> um, that is also an audio afterward if you uh, if you have the audiobook versions. And it's on Ursula's experience of returning to Earthsea after uh, so many years in between the first four books and the final two. In the years since I began to write about Earthsea, I've changed, of course, and so have the people who read the books. All times are changing times, but ours is one of massive, rapid, moral and mental transformation. Archetypes turn into millstones, large simplicities get complicated, chaos becomes elegant, and what everybody knows is true turns out to be what some people used to think. It's unsettling. For all our delight in the impermanent, the entrancing flicker of electronics, we also long for the unalterable. We cherish the old stories for their changelessness. Arthur dreams eternally in Avalon. Bilbo can go there and back again, and there is always the beloved familiar Shire. Don Quixote sets out forever to kill a windmill. So people turn to the realms of fantasy for stability, ancient truths, immutable simplicities. And the mills of capitalism provide them. Supply meets demand. Fantasy becomes a commodity, an industry. Commodified fantasy takes no risks. It invents nothing, but imitates and trivializes. It proceeds by depriving the old stories of their intellectual and ethical complexity, turning their action to violence, their actors to dolls, and their truth-telling to sentimental platitude. Heroes brandish their swords, lasers, wands, as mechanically as combine harvesters reaping profits. Profoundly disturbing moral choices are sanitized, made cute, made safe. The passionately conceived ideas of the great storytellers are copied, stereotyped, reduced to toys, molded in bright colored plastic, advertised, sold, broken, junked, replaceable, interchangeable. What the commodifiers of fantasy count on and exploit is the insuperable imagination of the reader, child or adult, which gives even these dead things life, of a sort, for a while. Imagination, like all living things, lives now, and it lives with, from, on, true change. Like all we do and have, it can be co-opted and degraded, but it survives commercial and didactic exploitation. The land outlasts the empires. The conquerors may leave desert where there was forest and meadow, but the rain will fall, the rivers will run to the sea. The unstable, mutable, truthful realms of once upon a time are as much a part of human history and thought as the nations in our kaleidoscopic atlases, and some are more enduring. We have inhabited both the actual and the imaginary realms for a long time, but we don't live in either place the way our parents or ancestors did. Enchantment alters with age, and with the age. We know a dozen different Arthurs now, all of them true. The Shire changed irrevocably even in Bilbo's lifetime. Don Quixote went riding out to Argentina and met, and met Jorge Luis Borges there. Plus a même chose, plus a change. It's been a joy to me to get back to Earthsea and find it still there, entirely familiar and yet changed and still changing. What I thought was going to happen isn't what's happening. People who aren't or what I thought they were 
and I lose my way on islands I thought I knew by heart. So, there are, so these are reports of my explorations and discoveries, tales from Earthsea for those who have liked or think they might like the place and who are willing to accept these hypotheses. Things change. Authors and wizards are not always to be trusted. Nobody can explain a dragon. Until next time. <laughs>